continuing our discussion of human evolution, when we compare apes and humans, we see differences that are more than just morphological. There are genetic similarities as well. And in fact, if we use the genetic similarities to try to create the phylogenies or estimate the phylogenies of the great apes, we get uh, remarkably consistent patterns as we would expect. So when we use mitochondrial DNA, so that's maternally inherited, we get a tree like this where chimps are each other as closest relatives, then related to humans, then gorilla, then orangutan, and then this is an outgroup that is a primate that is not a great ape. When we use protein Y on the Y chromosome, we get human and chimp as closest relatives, then gorilla, then orangutan, then baboon, that's the outgroup. And then if we use an autosomal gene, beta globin, you can see some diversity within humans, but then humans relate to chimps, and then gorilla, orangutan, and then gibbon. And so we see the same pattern in all of these, that the closest relatives to humans are chimps, the closest relatives to chimps are humans. Those two species are then related to gorillas, then to orangutans. Or in another way of thinking about it, within the great apes, orangutans are basal to the gorilla human chimp clade. And then within that clade, gorillas are basal to humans and chimps, humans and chimps being what are called sister taxa, most closely related to each other. Or if you include both chimps, the chimps are sister taxa to each other, and then related to humans. We can also date the time of this. So if we think about the use of a molecular clock that we talked about in the molecular evolution section, when you do this dating, you get this split between humans and chimps at about five million years. So it's about five million years ago that humans and chimps split from one another. About five million years ago, there was an organism that was the ancestor of both humans and chimps. And some of them went off and evolved into humans, and some of them went off and evolved into chimpanzees. So that's how we're related. So what's the history of these lineages, or in particular the human lineage? So if we think about doing human fossil studies, there are some problems with doing fossil studies with humans, and is best seen when we think about a, a field of study called taphonomy. Taphonomy is the study of fossil formation. And when we use taphonomy to think about human fossilization, we realize that in fact humans are a terrible species to try to do fossil studies with. Because first of all, the environment that our ancestors lived in were forests and grasslands, and those are two of the worst environments that generate fossils because when the organism dies, it's on the surface and it will get torn apart by scavengers and it'll be exposed to sun and being stepped on much more than things that live in aqueous environments like rivers or lakes or oceans where as soon as they die and they sink to the bottom, they have a reasonably good chance of being covered over by silt or uh, sand or something and being preserved much better. So our ancestors lived in environments that were not particularly good for making fossils. The population size was also fairly small. So humans lived in small groups, disparate groups. There weren't huge herds of humans roaming across the plains. And so the fact that human population size has been pretty small means there weren't that many individuals to die and leave fossils. And then suitable fossilizable parts Human skeletons are actually somewhat fragile compared to a lot of other organisms. And for that reason, some of our best data actually comes from fossilized teeth. Another problem that comes up with human fossil studies is the logistics. We evolved in Africa, and Africa is not the most stable, organized part of the world to do fossil hunting and science. On the other hand, um, advantages for doing human fossil studies include there's lots of effort and motivation, right? We care more about humans than any other single species. There are economic applications. So in fact, if you've seen the TV show Bones, she's a forensic anthropologist. There are people who receive training that allows them to work with human fossils because that training also allows them to work with police departments and provide useful information um, about murder victims. When I was an undergraduate, I took a forensic anthropology class, and we had the coolest class project ever, because um, towards the end of the semester, the police found a murder victim and brought his skeleton into the lab. And we actually worked with the professor to determine age and race and sex of the skeleton that we were then able to provide to the police to provide them with helpful information 
for identification because the body had been dumped over the winter and all the clothes had rotted off and it had no identification. So we have other financial reasons why we have a number of people that are able to do these studies. And then finally, humans do have several unique and distinctive features. There are things about the human skeleton that are unlike that of other mammals and even other primates and other great apes that are closer related to us. And so when you find a fossil that has some of those distinct features, you know that you're looking at either one of our ancestors or one of the relatives of our ancestors. So let's take a look at a diagram here of different species. So this is a slightly unfortunate figure in that gorilla is presented almost as if it was an ancestor of humans. That's not true. However, gorillas do show the likely position of a thing called a foramen magnum in the skull. So the foramen magnum is the whole ventral surface of your skull where the spine inserts. And so a foramen for whole, magnum for big, that's the big hole in your skull. And that's towards the back because um, gorillas tend to walk in a kind of hunched over leaning forward position. And so the spine inserts in the back of the skull and it's projecting out. Looking over time, so about six million years ago or so, we have fossils of Sahelanthropus. The Sahel is an area in Africa. And the frame and magnum is still towards the back of the skull, maybe a little bit further up than the gorilla. Australopithecus africanus, so this is more recent, about three million years ago. You can see the frame and magnum is still kind of towards the back, but a little bit more towards the front than gorilla. Homo ergaster, which is within the last two million years ago, the foramen magnum is really quite far forward. And then Homo sapiens, which comes from within the last or fraction of a million years, the foramen magnum is centered in the skull, and that's because we walk upright, and our skull is kind of perched on a vertical spine. Now, when we go back and look at things like Aurorin and Sahelanthropus, there's a debate about whether they're one of our ancestors, right? So they're along that lineage leading to modern humans or maybe they are relatives of the lineage leading to humans. And the fossil record is kind of sparse and not totally well resolved for humans. It's sometimes very difficult to, to figure out whether they are our ancestors or relatives of our ancestors. But even if they're relatives of our ancestors, they are indicative of what was happening at least back here in human history. So let's think about the traits that humans have and primates. So primates in general have large brains. They have overlapping binocular vision, so 3D vision, because our eyes overlap in their visual field. In terms of senses, sight has become prioritized over smell, which is unusual within mammals, right? So although mammals basically do vision and smell and hearing, there's a different prioritization in terms of how they make their decisions. For example, uh, my dog is much more interested in how people smell than really what they look like, right? But primates in general have focused more and more of the brain towards sight and less and less of the brain towards smell. Primates have heterodont dentition. We have different types of teeth, incisors, canines, premolars, and molars. And we have a clavicle, nails, thumbs, in terms of skeletal features and digits. Within primates, when we look at humans, we have bipedalism, so true bipedalism. We walk around upright all the time instead of just sometimes, like chimps. We have even larger brains than the other primates do. We have development of different areas of the brain, so different parts of our brain are larger than our close relatives, in particular parts of the brain associated with speech. And then our skeletons are actually lighter and thinner than our closest relatives. So in fact, chimps and gorillas are much, much, much stronger than us. In fact, this is one of the dangers of working with chimpanzees is they can accidentally break people's arms and break people uh, without even trying because they're just so much stronger than us. It's this kind of unusual feature of humans. We've become kind of the little wimpy nerds of the primate order. We have the bigger brains and the wimpier skeletons and muscles. Tool use, interestingly enough, is not uniquely human. For a lot of history, we used to think that we distinguished ourselves from animals by using tools, but there are a number of other examples of animals that use tools, right, these otters use rocks to break apart clams. These macaques actually wash their potatoes in the water. 
this crow can create and bend a wire into a tool to solve this puzzle. Chimpanzees use sticks to break open nuts. There's actually a, a baby watching its mother and learning how to do that. These birds grab stones and use them to break open the eggs of other birds. This bird is using a kind of a, a stick here to get out termites. This bird is actually dropping little stuff on the surface of the water so fish will come up and eat it and then it can grab the fish. So tool use is not uniquely human, although it will figure in prominently in human evolutionary history.